So Acts chapter 2, and this is, uh, I hope you were able to, to go along as Colleen read that. This is a beautiful summary of what happened in the early church. There's several of these. If you're reading through the book of Acts, there's three or four summary statements of this happened, that happened, and then bam, look, the church was together. And that's really what the entire book of Acts is about. It's about the birth of the church, the expansion of the church, and the extension of the church. How two, two men, two apostles, really, Peter and Paul, took the gospel from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. That's, what, that's the entire book of Acts, most scholars would say, in, in, in like a nutshell. Uh, two cities, two apostles, the Jews to the Gentiles, uh, and everything in between. And this is what it took to make that happen. And so this is a beautiful model. I know we have to be careful when we read narratives, when we read stories from the early church, because if we're not careful, we'll make it, turn it into a law, even though there's not really any commands in this passage we're going to read. Yet, I think we're going to find this is a very compelling model for what Christ is seeking to do in his church all the way around the world throughout history until he returns. This is what we should all be doing. We should all be engaged in the kind of community we see here. And that's really, um, spoiler alert, that is the missing ingredient that I think we, a lot of us have experienced it in different churches and a lot of uh, rogue, lone ranger Christians are out there and, and they're stuck. They're not growing, they're, they're dissatisfied, they're, there's discontentment and they don't understand why and it's because there's this missing ingredient of community. And we see it here, we see the power of it, we see the beauty of it. The church came together, if you look at the, right before verse 42, this was the day of Pentecost. All these people from every nation under heaven were gathered together. The Spirit of God came down in great power and conviction. Peter preached the gospel. 3,000 people were converted, bam, on the spot. So they essentially have a mega church in Jerusalem, right? From day one, there's this mega church, 3,000 brand new converts needing to be trained, needed to be discipled. So what did they do? Did they go to Cracker Barrel and have lunch and say, I can't wait till next Sunday? That's what a lot of Christians do. Maybe they've grown up that way. It's Christianity is a Sunday event. And if you do grow at all, it's a happy accident. We'll just leave it to chance. And, you know, that's what a lot of people believe. They live their life that way. But that's not what the early church did. It's amazing. In fact, skip back to verse 41. So those who received his word, the apostles' word, Peter, the gospel, were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. In the very next verse, look what it says. And they devoted themselves. Do you know what that word means, devoted? Some of your translations may say they continued steadfastly. That word devoted, it means a single-minded pursuit. It means actually to give yourself away. These people received Christ through the gospel and then they gave themselves away. What did they give themselves away to? One another. They gave themselves away to one another in community. I mean, obviously they're giving themselves to Christ, but how they did that was in relation, relational beauty with, excuse me, with other people. That's the very first thing they did. They gathered together in these little missional communities, if you want to call it that, community groups, all throughout Jerusalem, and that's where real growth happened. In fact, Interesting, fun little fact about the book of Acts. Most of the conversions you read that happen in the book of Acts, with the exception of this first one here, which was on the first gathering, most of the conversions, most of the miracles, most of the dramatic encounters people have, did you know it did not happen on Sunday with the church in one place? You know where it happened? Monday through Saturday spread all throughout the city in these little pockets of communities. God was there. His spirit came down there in those places powerfully, powerfully, and he grew his church. That's how Jesus wishes to grow his church. You know, we gather together on Sunday. We gather, and then we grow and go in these little missional groups, these little pockets. That's the vision I want to cast a little bit this morning because every year when school is back in session, we relaunch our community groups. That's where we meet in different houses all throughout Volusia County in three different cities, uh, different nights of the week for this purpose, to do what we see here. So this is the missing green. Have you ever eaten a dish and something just wasn't quite right? <laughs> something was missing or something was just wrong? There's, there's some uh, a good southern host uh, that, that we spent the night with when we go to, to see my family in Arkansas, some really good friends of ours in Jonesboro, Arkansas, they always prevail upon us to spend the night with them the last night. So we did, 
And, and bless her heart, man, this sweet, sweet young lady, she got up at the crack of dawn and she was going to make biscuits from scratch. And she is an amazing cook. She could have her own cookbook published. So she got up at the crack of dawn and made this amazing batch of biscuits from scratch. You know what I mean? From scratch. It wasn't Pillsbury or, or like, you know, in a can that you pop. She actually made them from scratch. And I'm a glutton. So I was the first one to sit at the table and throw butter on those things. And I took a big bite and she was there watching me, you know. Some, something just wasn't right. And it wasn't just off a little. Something was really wrong with these biscuits. And it scared me because I thought, is this one of those things you're going to read about on the internet that woman mis mistook rat poison for, you know, <laughs> baking powder or something? But you know what it was? Very easy. M many ladies have probably made this mistake. Instead of putting baking powder in the biscuits, what did she put? Baking soda. And man, did it taste funny. It was like this tart, I can't, I'm not, a, I can't articulate food descriptions. It was just wrong. <laughs> there was a, a missing ingredient that was very critical. And, and there's an analogy there for Christians that maybe it's not that dramatic for them. Maybe something is just not right. They're, they're, they're not growing. They're, they read their Bible. They see what's supposed to happen, what they want to happen, what they pray will happen, but it's not. And they can't understand why they're stuck. Maybe there's just discouragement that's, that's pervasive. Maybe there's just chronic and habitual sin struggles in their life they don't seem to be able to kick. And they think, what is it that's missing? This is a missing ingredient that I've been a Christian since I was 22. I'm 44. I've been a pastor for 15 years. I do a lot of counseling. And a lot of the time, it's this. It's there's no community. You ask them, hey, look, is there anybody else? Is there a group of people that you meet with outside of Sunday that you, you talk to about these things? No. No, nobody. No friend, no community, no Christians in close proximity, nothing. And to them, that's, that wasn't even a second thought to them. It's like, well, yeah, no, no, I don't. No Christian has that, do they? Well, they do. They should. They're supposed to. That's God's desire. That's God's design. Um, so we're supposed to gather, we're supposed to grow, and then we're supposed to go. You see that in the book of Acts, and you see it in, in microcosm here. And just uh, to tip my hand a little bit, and confession's good for the soul, I teach on this all the time. I just, I, I hide it a little bit so you don't think I'm re-preaching the same sermon. We did better together on Christian friendships. We did, uh, we did the power of community. We did another message called Why Bother with Church? Sometimes we'll pick different passages, but this is such a prevalent theme in the Bible. I think uh, I would be remiss if I didn't at least touch on that once a year. And this is no better time than the present because we're about to relaunch our community groups. But a lot of people understand and discover that when you meet in little communities outside of the church and you start talking and you start cultivating relationships, it's messy. It is messy. And you know what? Sometimes it's hard. In fact, most of the time it's hard. Because you know what? If you want to find a problem, you don't have to look very far. Go find two people and you will find two problems. Whether they're Christians or not, right? Because we still have pockets of, 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 of our flesh that are unredeemed, to, to, for lack of a better term. Places where the gospel needs to be massaged and worked in. We've got issues, we're awkward in places. We're stubborn. We're proud. That's why we need other people within the body of Christ to help us see ourselves better. We have blind spots. You know the thing about blind spots? You don't see them. You don't know they're there. It's, it's self-deception. You need help. You need outside help to see Christ more clearly. You cannot see and be discipled clearly for Jesus on your own. It won't work. It won't happen. But some people, they try it, and they get frustrated, and they're out. Um, Anne Rice is a famous author. I think she wrote some vampire books or something. Uh, anyway, most people know who she is. And I don't know much about her theology, but I, I, I found this quote. She said, for those of you who care, and I understand if you don't, today I quit being a Christian. I'm out. I remain committed to Christ, as always, but not to being, quote, Christian or to being part of Christianity. It's simply impossible for me to, quote, belong to this quarrelsome, hostile, disputatious, like I said, she's an author, uh, disputatious and deservedly infamous group. For 10 years, I've tried. I've failed. I'm an outsider. My conscience will allow nothing else. Anne Rice. Now, I could say a lot of things about that, but I'll, I will say this. 
My conscience will not allow me to not be a part of community because I find that there's these 55-something-odd commands that end with one another that I can't ignore. I can't, and you shouldn't either. Love one another, serve one another, confess your sins to one another, bear one another's burdens, forgive one another. I could go on and on, counsel one another. How do you do that on Sunday? How many of you have done that today? You can't. I've heard people try to squeeze, like a shoehorn, a shoe that's too little, like a Cinderella story. You try to shove all these one another's on Sunday morning. You can't do it. It won't happen. I don't care how gifted you are, how people-oriented you are, there's no way you can possibly fulfill all the one another's on a Sunday morning. Most of us get here late, some of us leave early, barely talk to one another, we sit down, that's okay, I'm not decrying that, or lamenting that, or scolding you, or wagging my finger at you, that's just the nature of Sunday morning. When did all these one another's happen in the early church? Verses 42 to 47, and they were together every day. And I know this is a new... I know we're living in America in Central Florida in 2019, and every single day you're not going to gather together in somebody's house, probably, if you could, and if you want to, that's awesome. Uh, but it's a challenge, you know, because we're scattered all over the place. Um, but my conscience will, allow, will not allow me to neglect this, to ignore this, or just to turn away in rebellion against this. This is the missing ingredient that I think a lot of mistaken Christians, they just haven't, they haven't folded that into the recipe and so what they're eating is they're not growing the joy is not there the, the sense of purpose and all but I don't want to get ahead of myself let's look at this together just three points today number one wh what is this power of community what does this missing ingredient actually do uh, first is when they met together they connected to God okay point number one they connected to God if you were doing a directional outline this will be up they met together and connected to God up in worship. What does it say they were devoted to? We'll look at verse 42. And they devoted themselves, they gave themselves away to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. This is not awe. It's hard for me as an Arkansan to say this. A-W-E. This is awe came upon them. Okay. And the word is actually translated fear, but it's not they were afraid and they were shaking in their boots. Something very powerful and majestic was happening when these early Christians gathered together, and it was undeniable. And you could see it. You could sense it. You could feel it. You, you experienced this. When God's people met together, even outside of the local gathering on Sunday in, in houses all across Jerusalem, and they devoted themselves, they connected to God, they received the apostolic teaching, the gospel, and, and the commandments that Jesus left, and they were praying together, breaking bread, celebrating communion, something really magnificent happened that was unexplainable. Nobody could explain this other than God showed up in a powerful and a dramatic way, and everyone knew it. Nobody could explain it. Fear, reverence, amazement, excitement. They were blown away with what was happening. Something supernaturally was happening. In a way that it didn't when they were by themselves just reading their Bible in the room alone. And look, you're not going to hear me say that's wrong. That's not. I hope all of us spend t quiet time alone without the distractions and the messiness of community. You need that. But God does something spectacular when God's people gather together. He really does. That's when the room shakes, right? You read in the book of Acts. The place they were gathered together shook and the Holy Spirit filled them all and they were filled with great power and witness. One of my favorite preachers, his name is Martin Lloyd-Jones. He preached in Wales in the early 1900s. And man, just reading some stories of the revival that took place in that little town uh, just has always thrilled my heart. But there's one that, that takes the cake, and it was about a witch. There was a witch. Every Sunday, she would walk by the place where Martin Lloyd-Jones was preaching the gospel, and the people of Sandfields of Berevan were gathered together. And she was curious. She knew something powerful was happening there. She was connected spiritually, but on the wrong side, right? On the wrong side of the force. And eventually she came and she heard the gospel and she was converted. And years later, she told Martin Lloyd-Jones, she said, I've always been, this creeped me out, even as a witch. She said, but I would walk by the place where you were gathered and you were preaching. And I could hear the proclamation. And she said, I sensed that there was a mighty power present in that place. And it scared me. It scared me. 
And she said, and it also made me curious. She said, the only, the only way I could distinguish that kind of power from the spiritual powers that I was involved in as a witch and a medium, she said, was that it was clean. It's interesting, isn't it? Holy spirit. Unclean spirit versus clean spirit. And eventually she experienced and tasted that clean spirit she was talking about. She was converted. Isn't that interesting? Even a witch sat up and took notice and said, there, I don't know what they're talking about there. I don't know what they're doing in there. But there's something powerful in there, and it scares me as a witch. But it drew her, too. There was something magnetizing about it, something that, that was just so compelling she had to go see for herself. That happened here. It says, awe came upon everyone. Fear filled everyone that was there. Have you ever experienced that in a community of Christians? And, and it would include a Sunday, too. Not just, man, the message fell on everybody, but you just see things. You see people growing. You see transformation happening. You see people that were, that were stingy and self-focused and narcissistic. And all of a sudden, you see they're radically generous. They're humble. They're changing. They're growing. They're becoming Christ-like. And it's like, man, this is amazing. I can't explain this. That's right. That's all. All falls on you. I mean, we're, we are all in... I'm sorry for the Ar Arcans and... Uh, we are all in awe of something or someone. We are, because we're designed to be. We're hardwired to be, maybe overwhelming. I can use that as a synonym, okay? We're all overwhelmed at something. What is it that's overwhelming you? Is it Jesus? Is it the work that he's doing in and through his people in the world that causes you to, to be a champion for his mission and the lives of unbelievers around you? I mean, we're all overwhelmed and in awe of something. Sports or health, beauty, Whatever it is, these people were overwhelmed and in awe of the power and the presence of, of Christ. The Holy Spirit was there, which is really, that's a whole other sermon. The Holy Spirit seems to be especially drawn to pockets of Christians who meet together for prayer and for gospel proclamation and in unity. Holy Spirit's drawn to that. You hear a lot of people talk about, man, the power of the Holy Spirit. If you want the Holy Spirit to be present in power... Gather together with other people, being united in Christ, and pray, and break bread, and fellowship, and man, the Holy Spirit will be there, and true growth will take place. It's a missing ingredient for a lot of people. They were devoted to those things. They were together, they were united, and all came down. There was a power there. And again, a lot of people don't sense this power. A friend of mine, Jeff Eckert, you may know him, um, he... he he was in Costa Rica for a while. He was wanting to be a surfer. I shouldn't say wanting to be. He is a surfer. Um, he was surfing there, and one of his friends was a native there. And I think it's, there's some impoverished pockets in, in, in Costa Rica, of course. And uh, I think some, a wealthy American gave a brand new motor scooter to a native that was there uh, and never really bothered to teach him how to crank, how to kickstart it. You know, little motorcycles and mopeds, you kickstart them. So here was this native, and he had a brand new little motor pad motorcycle, had brand new wheels, had a shiny aluminum engine, but he couldn't get the engine started, but he was so proud of it. You know what he did? He pushed it all around the villages to show all his friends, like, look at this, man. And it is, it is a funny story, but you know what? I, I've been that kind of Christian before. I've got this shell of, of potential power, but man, I, there's no... There's no Combustion. <laughs> Engines are, there has to be fire there, right? For it to work. Gasoline, spark plug, kickstart, bam, you're on, you, you are going 40 miles an hour down the, down the road. But so many Christians, man, we have forgotten the one thing that, that, that Jesus left us with that has power, and it's the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Without that, you've got, you've got no unction. You've got no thrust. You've got no energy. See, these Christians were gathered together, and I believe when it says they were, break, they were uh, devoting themselves to the breaking of bread, there's a definite article, the word the in Greek in front of that, the breaking of bread. What's that mean? Communion. Communion. They were breaking bread. What is communion? What's the Lord's Supper? What's it commemorating? The death of Christ, right? Jesus gave himself, Jesus devoted himself for them. He gave himself away for them. And so they're giving themselves away to one another on his behalf. Great power there. That's a beautiful picture of the gospel and powerful things happen. Wow. <laughs> powerful things happen. I can't see you now. This is really scary. <laughs> That's okay, guys. We're all right. I will tell you this. I have been intrigued and a little bit fascinated 
the last, I shouldn't say fascinating, that's a terrible word. I've been intrigued and very concerned the last few weeks as we've seen more and more uh, mass shootings happen. Have you? And it's been interesting to me that the FBI is always scrambling to figure out who are these people? Who are these people that are committing these atrocious crimes, high profile shootings? And you know what? Just about 95% of the time, do you know what's true in these cases? These people were extremely isolated. And in their extreme isolation, they cultivated extreme views. And then they did something psychopathic, sociopathic. And you know what? When the FBI is trying to figure out who were these people, they can't. They, <laughs> they, they can't figure out who they are. Because you know what? There's nobody to talk to. Nobody knew them. Nobody understood what they struggled with. They had, all they have is some blank, uh, clean wiped... Um, social media website to go to that may or may not even be true. That happens all the time. It happens all the time, and it's scary. You know, whenever we isolate ourselves, bad things happen. The, this power that we're talking about, it's not there. It's not there, and bad things happen. Well, I can't see my notes, and I can't see you, but I know God's here. <laughs> Lord, help us. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing was they met together uh, and they connected to God and it was up in worship. The second thing that happened was they connected to one another in fellowship. They connected to one another in fellowship, point two. You guys with me here? It'll be okay. Don't worry about it. Don't be distracted. When they met together um, with other believers who were like them but unlike them, that's a really interesting theme you find in the Bible. Did you know that? When Adam was created, yay, praise God, let there be light. When Adam was created, for the first time, God looked at his creation and he said something was not good. Did you know that? He made the animals, good. He made the stars, the sun, the seasons, all that, good, 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 good. He made Adam, uh-oh, something's not good. And it wasn't because there was a design flaw. Do you know what wasn't good about Adam? He was alone. That's right. God never intended for us to be alone. We see that in the very beginning of creation, and we see it all the way through the Bible. Whenever God was assembling the tribes, he put them into 12 tribes, and we see it also in the early church that we were never intended to be alone. That was never, ever God's design. We're supposed to be together. You can't represent God alone. Did you know that? Let us make man in our image. So if you're by yourself... You're not really showing the world what God is like. He's a trinity, tri-unity. And as a Christian, you can't really bear the image of Christ alone because Jesus was always in community with his disciples. I mean, we see these things even in the animal kingdom. Did you know that you see this in the animal kingdom? I've been thinking about this so much this week. I've thought more about community than I ever have in my life. When you look around at other animals uh, that are thriving and flourishing and growing and healthy, what do you see? Schools of fish... You see flocks of birds, you see colonies of insects, hives of bees, packs of wolves. Why? Because animals are better together. Those, most animals are social. And when they're not social, bad things happen. They can't hunt and forage for food as good as they could. They can't protect themselves as good as they could. It just does not happen. So your need for other people in, in relation, as a Christian, it's not as a design flaw. You're hardwired that way. You're hard, I, I believe God put all these things in the animal kingdom and in the world around us uh, and even built it into the analogies we use. What are we called more than anything else as a church? We're called a family. We're a flock of sheep, right? We need each other and we need a shepherd. That's by design. That is by design. And you even see... You even see things and hear things sometimes. I saw a meme floating around a while back and it said this. It said, a wise man can always be found alone. I mean, that sounds clever, but I mean, then was Jesus stupid? Because <laughs> he always had Peter, James, John, and the 12 with him, always. And then you'll see a meme that says something like, a weak man can always be found in a crowd. Well, then Jesus was a weakling then because he always was around people. Those things sound clever, but they just don't work. They don't work. 
You end up a, a, a messed up and confused individual when you're alone. That's why Proverb 18.1 says a fool isolates himself. And when the Bible uses the word fool, it's not an intellectual judgment. It's not saying, boy, you're stupid. It, it's more of a moral judgment. It's like you are rebelling and rejecting the way God made you. You're running away. You're trying for this slippery, elusive, glorified isolation and rugged individualism. And it's not going to work. You're going to end up getting hurt, and you're going to end up hurting somebody else. Extreme example is like the sociopathic people. This is what happens to some people who try to pursue glorified isolationism. I'm not talking about the wolf. I'm talking about the deer hoof in the wolf's mouth, right? That's what happens. We're easy pickings. When God made us to be together and we run off in glorified isolationism, guess what? We're vulnerable. I mean, you have to be vulnerable when you're in community. You have to be. That's why it's hard and it's messy and people don't want to engage. But listen, you're never more vulnerable than when you are by yourself. Never. Satan would prefer you just go, go on and, and run off by yourself. I was watching a, uh, some kind of a um, wilderness documentary with my kids. And, and I know we've talked about this, but watching a wolf pack and watching a pride of lions, uh, they will run as fast as they can at the pack to startle the animals that already had this bent toward, you know, whether it's a young calf or something, or whether it's a weak member, or whether it's just a stubborn member of the flock that runs off. They run at them and they're like, all right, there's the one, go get them. That happens in the church too. There's that one over there all by himself or all by herself. This would be easy, easy takedown. We'll separate and we'll destroy. And it happens, it happens all the time. This is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said. One of my favorite authors, he wrote a book called Life Together, and he said this, he said, sin demands to have a man by himself. Man, that's a, that's a good one-line quote right there, isn't it? Sin demands to have a man or woman by himself. It withdraws him from the community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over him, and the more deeply he becomes involved in it, the more disastrous is his isolation. Sin wants to remain unknown. It shuns the light. In the darkness of the unexpressed, it poisons the whole being of a person. This can happen even in the midst of a pious community. Did you hear that? This can happen even in the midst of a pious community, meaning this. And don't get mad at me. Let's just assume we're a pious community. You guys are all holy, right? Even in a pious community like Grace Life Church, this can happen. It will happen, and I'm certain it does happen. Some of you will isolate yourselves. You won't be in community with other Christians and you're struggling. I can tell I'm not trying to speak prophetically, but I'm just telling you, if this is you and sin demands to have you by yourself and it has you by yourself, you are struggling. And this is something you've been missing maybe your entire Christian life. You've ran from it. Maybe you tasted bitter fruit of bad community and you said never again like Anne Rice. I've tried and the infamous group and, but listen guys, don't give up. Christ never gave up on you. He never gave up on you. This is a command from God. He wants us to unite together and to meet together because we're better together. You are no good on your own. It's dangerous. It's foolish. And I would go as far to say it's unchristian. It's unchristian. It's a bad idea all the way around. But this was a powerful community that met together in this fellowship. And we don't have time to go into it, but if you back up at the very beginning of chapter 2, I was reading this out loud to somebody the other day. I couldn't, even I couldn't even pronounce without practicing some of the different uh, global places that these people, they were from every nation under heaven, gathered together on the day of Pentecost. They heard Peter preach the gospel, and the very next thing, they're crammed in houses together. And you think, well, what's the big deal? Well, here's the big deal. Those people before that happened had nothing in common. Because here's what we'll do. We'll say, okay, okay, I'll be in community with people that are like me. Well, what do you mean like me? That like sushi and bowling and midnight walks on the beach? And Well, that's not always healthy. <laughs> this, is not, this is not uniformity, okay? This is true unity. You know the one thing these people all had in common? Jesus. That's what they had in common. In fact, the disciples, if you look at the disciples, did you know that there was a zealot that was one of the 12 disciples, which means he went around killing people who worked for Rome and there was a tax collector who worked for Rome named Matthew that was one of the disciples. Do you know they would have killed each other had Jesus not united them? They would have. There's people, <laughs> there's people in this room right here. <laughs> the only thing, bless, bless your heart and bless our heart, you wouldn't sit together at lunch if you were in high school. You wouldn't even hang out in the break room together, okay? 
uh, if it weren't for Christ, but he has united you. And that's the greatest and strongest and most permanent bond you have anyway. We need, listen, learn from the Garden of Eden. When God brought Adam a helper who was suitable for him, he brought him somebody unlike him. Like him, a human being, but unlike him, a woman. I would go as far to say somebody mysterious and a little bit strange to him that was good for him, right? We tend to get into community like, you like fitness? I like fitness. You like bowling? I like bowling. Ta-da, we're in a community. And all you have is just a bunch of identical twins in a room and they're not challenging each other. You vote Republican? I vote Republican. You vote Democratic? I vote. You like this person? You like this politician? Nobody gets challenged that way. I was reading a book this week and it, it, was, it was a man and he was commending somebody in his church that came and they said, look, I usually don't say this outright, but, but this, is my, this is my particular political view. Can you find me a community group where you know that there are people who don't vote that way because I want to be challenged. I want to know how other people think. That's so rare today. That is so rare. And I would say it's, it's healthy because we have blind spots. All of us have blind spots. Every single person in here. And you can say I'm getting political if you want to. I just know people on the other side of what I vote have helped me tremendously when I've listened to them and have introduced Jesus into a political conversation in ways I couldn't have connected the dots on my own. We all need that. These people weren't at each other's throats. These people were united. That's the awe. That's part of the awe is like, how does this person and this person meet together and love each other and serve one another? Because out there in the world, they beat each other's throats. In fact, I would go so far as to say, you would never see a community like this with the Roman religions of the day. You would never see them gathered together, united, in awe, power coming down, giving themselves away. They didn't do that. In fact, even the emperor, I think it was Julian, he wrote and he said, these Galileans take better care of the poor than we do. They take better care of our poor than we do. And look at the love they have for one another. How did they see that? This is what I'm trying to tell you, and this is the last point we need to get to. Yeah, let's get to the last point. So they met together uh, and connected to God up in worship. They met together, they connected to one another in for fellowship. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> And then the last thing that you see here is they met together and they connected to the outsiders. Because check this out. This is so amazing. And I know I skipped over some of this. It's okay. The lights were out. I couldn't see it. <laughs> Verse 44. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions. Uh-oh. Sounds like communism, doesn't it? No, 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 no. Listen. Communism. <laughs> You're forced to do this. You have to do it. The government makes you give your stuff away. This was willingly. This was not begrudgingly. Nobody, listen, nobody had to make these people gather together every day in their homes. Nobody had to make them sell their possessions. Nobody had to make them pray and break bread. You couldn't keep these people apart. That is the power of the gospel. And, I, and I'm going to keep reading in a minute. Hang on, I just want to say this. I can sense... My wife and I have been into church planning for five years now. And I, I, I just keep it real in here, okay? Let's just keep, you love it when I confess stuff, don't you? <laughs> years ago, <laughs> years ago, I would gather together on Sunday and I would, I even led a group at the other church I was in. And I don't know, man, if certain people rubbed me the wrong way and Sarah and I during the week, we didn't have a whole bunch of kids back then. And so we'd say, who are we going to hang out with? Who are we going to go out with tonight? And you going to go out with this person? No, I'm going to go out with them. I, I'm just being real. What about those people? No, they're weird. <laughs> not knowing that we're weird. You know what I mean? But listen, I got to tell you, and I'm not, I promise, I'm not putting a feather in my hat at all. This is God. It's got to be God because it ain't Tommy Clayton. We'll be, we'll be together and bored during the week. And who you want to hang out with? You know what? Let's call these people over. And she's like, really? No, and she's not saying they're weird. She's saying, normally, you would say they're weird. I'm like, no, I, want, I, want, I love them. Let's get together with them. It's, I've, seen, I've seen God work growth in me that it could only be God because I'm a weirdo. I'm a, I'm a weird person, guys. I'm telling you, if you're in my community group, you know I'm a weirdo. I'm a strange bird. I'm up here talking. I get energized from being in the public, but I'm a homebody. I don't want to be around people. I'd rather crawl in a corner and read a J.R. Token book and say, go away and leave me alone. But, but God has given me a love for sheep, for his sheep, and that helps me. When I'm with you guys, people that are 
that don't like sushi and, you know, <laughs> uh, bowling and all that stuff, that, that the only thing we have in common is Jesus, but you're unlike me in, in other ways, you sh- I feel strengthened and united. I'm a better Christian. We represent Christ better, and the world sits up and takes notice. It's like, what do these people have in common? Oh, it must be, it must be him. And that's what you see. Let me read the rest of this. Not communism. That was, that's where we're at, yeah. Verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having, what's that word? Favor. Having favor with all the people. So this is like going beyond the little house they're in. Having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So they would gather and then they would grow and they would go. And guess what? God was converting people through these little pockets of communities that were meeting everywhere. And you say, well, what do you mean? I'm saying this. The people that were outside that community, they were leaning in. They were curious. Maybe like that witch that that I told you about earlier. Something weird and yet powerful and dynamic is happening in there. And I want to know what it is. Do you know the world, if you want to use that term, outsiders, unbelievers, they're not in here right now. They can't see this. They're not going to listen to this if you give them a, a link to the sermon or a CD. But sometimes, friends, when we meet together in our little communities and our neighborhoods, unbelievers, do you know what? It's like Luke 15, that they lean, they lean in. And they want to listen and they want to watch. And the question is, what do they see and what will they hear? What will they hear? Political rancor? Social outrage? platitudes of of self-righteousness when they do it's Ann Rice forget it I'm out that's what I exactly what I thought that I would see in here and there nothing's changed or will they see this people giving themselves away selling their possessions and meeting needs in the church like you heard Patty's car somebody in this church generously met her needs with that car and I'm sure there's people in Ireland that hey how about your what happened to your car oh you know what God's people took care of that wow Really? How much did they charge you? Nothing. They, they paid for it. They lean in. And what do they see? Radical generosity that they can't explain. They can't explain. Why would you give yourself away like that? Because you trust God. He's better. He's all that we need, right? They had favor with the people. That's what's so strange because our message is offensive. We know that. You can't lose that. That's the power is that we have a message that the world doesn't understand and they reject. But the lifestyle... Don't you know the world wants this? The world wants to belong. The world wants to be known. What human being that you've ever met doesn't want two things, to be fully known and to be fully loved? You know anybody like that, that doesn't want those things, that doesn't try to find them? You know, there's no substitutes for this, but there's a lot of counterfeits. There's a lot of counterfeit because we're made for community and we'll find it somewhere and it'll be on our terms. We'll define what kind of community we want to be a part of and then we'll probably destroy it. (laughs) now this is something that's powerful this is something that's beautiful you know what I got another quote for you here I got a couple minutes left (laughs) here's a substitute and look I'm not saying this is bad because if you're a part of a crossfit gym good on you you keep on muscling your way through life and being fit I wish I could join you one of these days I am but not yet I got six kids I can't my crossfit gym is everything to me Oh, man, I don't like the way that starts. I've met my boyfriend and some of my very best friends through CrossFit. When my boyfriend and I started apartment hunting this spring, we immediately zeroed in on the neighborhood closest to our gym, even though it would increase our commute to work. We did this because we couldn't bear to leave our community. CrossFit is family, laughter, love, and community. I can't imagine my life without the people I've met through it. You know, the saddest thing about this, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't think, as an unbeliever, okay? You're going to find it somewhere. The saddest thing is, I wish I heard more Christians talking about their community that way. Don't you? I can't imagine my life without it. It's like if I'm moving or if I'm finding a new job, eventually I'll get around to figuring out, well, maybe we should find a community of Christians to worship with and gather with. But it's always like fifth down the line here, not first. It's really sad. But what you see in... Acts chapter 2 is that you see, sorry, you see a lot of people that are uh, different from one another, but what unites them is their quest. I'm sorry, guys. I love the, I love the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I mean, what, what does a soldier, uh, a ranger, a wizard 
four hobbits and a dwarf. <laughs> Why in the world will those weirdos be hanging out together? Oh, it's for a pretty good reason. They're about to change the world and rescue and deliver Middle Earth from the evil eye. Okay, you get the point, right? I think Gerald Tolkien was on to something, wasn't he? <laughs> and hopefully that's what people, when they look in the window and see our weird community, it's like, man, what in the world do they all have in common? Oh, we're, we're turning the world upside down or right side up maybe, right? We're on a quest. We are living on mission together and we can't do it alone. We've tried. We've tried. You go down in flames when you try to live on mission alone. That's why Jesus sent his apostles out in pairs of two. That's why when we send a missionary like Patty to the mission field, we send her to a church. We don't send her just to live in isolation by herself. That would be spiritual suicide. I would go as far as to say. Now, we, we meet together to connect to God. We meet together to connect to one another. And we meet together to connect with the world. We're better together. And man, there's so many other things I could say, but I just want to, I want to close with this. Um, this is a family, right? The church is called a family. It's called a flock. And God has brought us in this family. We were outsiders. We didn't belong. And he grafted us in. And I got a confession to make here, okay? And if I've talked about it before, I know it's been years ago. So let me just tell you again. I feel really bad telling you this, but since I was a kid, I have been fascinated and intrigued with the mafia. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why. Maybe it's just the power display. Maybe it's the respect, the loyalty, the wealth. I don't know why, but I've just, I'm, I'm even drawn to like watching documentaries about these families and the Godfathers and the Genovese family and the, you know, some of those weird Italian names you can't pronounce. Um, but here's, here's one of the reasons I think I'm so intrigued by it. It's because it's a family. It's the family, right? You're brought in the family, and buddy, you belong. You are protected. Can nobody touch you? And if they do, they're going to get whacked, right? There's loyalty there. There's fierce loyalty to a mafia family when you're brought in. Did you know that? Oh, no, I offended somebody. They're like, no, don't leave. There's fierce loyalty to a mafia family. But do you know what you have to do to get into a mafia family? Did you guys know this? Oh, you got to work. You got to work hard. You got to be fiercely loyal. You got to give yourself to this Don, this, this family member at the top. But the thing is, he's a crook. He's a tyrant. He slaughters people. He, the whole thing is built on corruption and lies, which is why I feel bad telling you I'm fascinated by it. In fact, did you know to be a made man? When you're a made man in the mafia, you know what that means? Nobody can touch you, buddy. Because of the name that you have, have adopted, you've been adopted in that family, you are untouchable if you're a made man. But, but here's the thing. In order to be a made man or, or woman, I guess, you know what you have to do? You've got to kill somebody. You've got to slaughter somebody. And it's usually bloody. It's usually gory and violent. And it's an act of vengeance that the Don wants you to carry out on somebody who sinned against him. Now, here's what's interesting to me. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this, don't you? Think of the family that we're in. Think of the father that we have. You know what we had to do to get in this family? We had to work really hard. We had, no, 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 you, you didn't do squat to get in this family. We don't belong here. We don't deserve this. In fact, the person that did all the work was the father of this family. You know what he had to do? He had to get whacked. And it was bloody and it was gory and it was violent. But now we're made. We are made men and women. We are untouchable. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's the family that we belong to. We didn't do anything to get in this family. We didn't earn it. We had no merit. We had nothing redemptive to offer to God. He didn't see anything attractive in us other than our need. And now we're in the family and we are made and we're untouchable and we belong to him and we have his name and we're justified and we're cleansed. But you know what he had to do to accomplish that? He had to lose community. God the Father and Jesus lost all community on the cross. Did you know that? He had nobody. His Father forsook him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His friends abandoned him. He had nothing. He was cut off, crucified, slaughtered for us so that we could be brought in. That's the only reason that we can belong to a community like this. That's what unites us. That's what we commemorate every first Sunday when we come together and celebrate communion. What a powerful thing. And so uh, I close with that, and we're going we're gonna to have a time of reflection in just a minute, and I'm going to make some important announcements, and then Steve's going to come up and give it an important announcement. But the question that I want us to ask ourselves is, if these things are so important, 
If doctrinal purity, relational beauty, living on mission together, and that happens in community, if that's so important, what are we doing as a church to, to help that happen, to cultivate that? Here's what we're doing. We are relaunching community groups after Labor Day. I think it's September the, I think it may be the 11th. 9-11 falls on that, I think, that Wednesday. And so uh, here's what we're doing. We're always asking more people to come on board and to help us either host a community group in your home or help us lead a community group. You do the facilitating, okay? Um, and those things sound intimidating, I think, to a lot of people, and we don't want that to be the case. So here's what we're doing. Next Sunday, August the 18th, Right after the sermon, we are hosting a free luncheon back here. And it's not going to be pizza and hot dogs, even though that'd be great if it was. Uh, it's going to be really good food because we want to show you, we want to serve you, okay? So if you are interested at all, we know that you need time to process this with your family, with your spouse maybe, okay? Uh, we didn't want to have it right now because some of you are like, oh, I'm not ready. So listen, think about this this week. How is God calling you to be a part of, of what the the book of Acts is showing us he wants us to be. Does he want you to host? Maybe to share the hosting responsibility with another family. That wouldn't be off the table. Maybe he wants you to help facilitate. Maybe there's some other role you can provide. You're not sure what it is. Then this luncheon is for you. It's next Sunday. Uh, child care is provided. You don't, it won't cost you anything. And uh, Steve Ekman is going to be our community group uh, overseer as an elder. And so he'll be sharing, I'll be sharing. So mark your calendar, and I'll tell you again next Sunday. Next Sunday, August the 18th, come to the meeting immediately following the service, and we're going to talk about what community groups at Grace Life Church are going to look like this year. And now as we, as we close, I'm going to pray in just a second. I want to ask you, are you... Are you a part of the family? <laughs> Have you brought it? You remember the, the update that Patty gave where she, she said her friend was talking about a lot of people think that you are born and you're already in the kingdom, uh, but it's the exact opposite. You're actually born and you're outside the kingdom. Christ has to do something to bring you in the kingdom and in the family. So my question is, are you in the family? Are you in the kingdom? Have you been born again? Have you confessed your sins to Christ and said, look, I know I don't deserve this. I don't belong here. I'm a sinner. If you only knew what I've done, uh, God does know what you've done. But it's not, there's no sin too great that, that Christ cannot forgive you. He died for sin. He died for sinners. So use this time as John comes to play uh, to just reflect on that beautiful reality, that beautiful truth that God has saved you and called you um, into community, into family with him. Are you a part of that? And here's something else to reflect on. Have you been... Have you been one of those Christians who have been maybe misguided? Or you've been hurt in the past and so you've ran from this. You said it'll be a long time before I will ever be a part of a small group of people outside of Sunday. It's too hard. It's too painful. I've been too damaged and hurt by it. Listen, friends, maybe God is, is giving you a little wake-up call today. Maybe there's growth that, that you have not seen happen in a long time because you've been living in disobedience to God. This is a time to confess that, to ask God to help you, to be bold, to be courageous, to be faithful, and be a part of the communities that we're going to offer here. So uh, let's just close in prayer. We'll let John play, and then we'll make a couple of announcements and hear our update from Steve, okay? Let's do that now. Lord, thank you so much for this powerful reminder from the book of Acts that you want us to be a part of the community that you have been forming since the day that you died on the cross and was raised from the dead Lord you have been forming communities pockets of people all over the world who have been brought into your family who have been redeemed who've confessed their sin and then you have united them to other members of the family other parts of the body you are the head you are the shepherd uh, you're the master you're the Lord and so I pray that today, if there's anyone here, God, who, number one, has not been brought into that family, you would convict them of their sin right where they're, where they're sitting, Lord, that they would just cry out and confess to you that, that they're a sinner and they need to be saved, they need to be redeemed. They want to believe the gospel that you died for them, that you lived the life they could never live, you died the horrible death they deserve, you rose from the grave to prove that, that God the Father accepted it. May this be the day of salvation for them. And others, Lord, they just ran from this, from this accountability, from this relational beauty because of the messiness of it or because they've been hurt. I pray that today would be the day you would draw them back close to you and they could recommit themselves to this.
and we could live on mission, the world would sit up and take notice and we would see people converted. And if anyone has a need, needs to confess a sin, needs to be prayed over for maybe their health, uh, maybe they're afraid, it's a new school year, maybe they're teaching, maybe they're a young person and there's anxiety and apprehension, they just want to meet with a member of our prayer team, I pray this would be the time that they would do that in the back. And I ask and pray all these things, Lord, and I ask for you to bless uh, Deltona High School as they start back next week with all the shootings still fresh, Lord, in everyone's minds. I know there's a lot of fear probably and apprehension. I pray that you would protect this school and all the other schools, the teachers, the faculty, the leaders, the students. Uh, may there be peace here, God. May people know that you're the Prince of Peace and they ultimately need, need to turn to you because safety is really a myth, Lord, at any given time. It could be our day to go and we want to have the security of knowing when we stand before you that we'll be accepted because of Christ. But I do pray that you would give this school a great year, Lord, at, at, at peace in the community and just the students would learn here and would be able to give back. And I ask and pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.